So the question we should ask ourselves is when humans react best, when they are rational or emotionally fear-based. We think this falls on our side of the house. For once, I only have one extension, but with six subpoints, where we talk about the idea that fear will still persist under the model, will still need mechanisms to overcome this fear, and all of those mechanisms that states use in policies to overcome fear are significantly worse by simply removing them. So let's do two points of rebuttal. So first of all, dangerous situations can still be assessed. If you're a rational being, you can still think that the situation is off, that there are a larger group of people than usual, that they have different types of arms and different types of gatherings. So you can still assess situations and still be a rational actor in war and still be an effective soldier without fear. Secondly, they bring up nukes. That's a very strong point. The question behind those nukes is, will it really be stopped? Because the only argument they give us is that fear stops you. Two things. A, compassion stops you in a lot of cases. We'll tell you where their policy often, thank you very much, is something that contributes to less compassion because it encourages mechanisms that reduce compassion within those soldiers. Secondly, we reject the idea that if you don't have fear, you no longer have a wish to live. We think it's an absurd characterization that fear is the only thing that keeps me alive. That's also the wish of experiencing pleasure later on, seeing my family again, a lot of positive information, positive emotions that makes me want to continue to live. That's very positive and very helpful. And if you can make the rational calculus that if I kill prisoners of war, if I torture people, if I make that attack, the US will finally decide to intervene in my country and stop us after the massacre of Srebrenica. That's a rational calculus you can make, and that is something that stops people also from doing those things. We think you're perfectly capable of making the rational calculus of wanting to experience pleasure again, of wanting to lead a normal life again, and not wanting retaliation that causes your life. That means nuking will still be stopped, genocide can still be stopped. Note also one fundamental flaw of their policy. Policy. Rwanda didn't have opening government's mechanism, yet the genocide still happened. So the entire idea that genocides are based on lacking fear, when those people in Rwanda are equally human and equally capable of experiencing fear, is completely false. Now let's look into the real-life scenario of why this is bad. Because that's what happens with fear. So we acknowledge fear happens under each model for each human, but states will still want to engage in wars. There are valid reasons, or very, very non-valid reasons, why general state officials, politicians want to engage in wars. What happens now? They realize their soldiers are capable of experiencing fear, and they need to develop policy mechanisms of how to overcome that fear. We hear an opening debate that talks about why some individual decisions are good, some individual decisions are bad. We tell you why it leads to general policies on a general structural political level that ultimately and, and overall will lead to more casualties and more harm for civilians. Six subpoints: distance to them, blanket quick reaction policies, drugs, extreme nationalism, extreme religion, thank you Kai, and extreme <laughs> hatred, dehumanization of people. Why is that the case? Because they want them to keep on going to spirit fear. So what do you do? If you know that your soldier experiences fear when they get too close, when they fear they're being personally targeted, you create mechanisms that make them less fearful. For example, not doing close level bombing where you have a higher chance of being A, accurate, and B, capable of assessing if it's a valid target, but rather bomb from a higher distance. We think that leads people to having higher casualties. Those are rational decisions made by politicians and generals because they know their soldiers will experience the fear. They will rebel against those actions. They will not engage in those missions or will fail in those missions because they're fearful. We enable them to have those missions. Taking away fear means extending military possible options. We think that's positive. Secondly, if you're fearing things, that also means your information shut down. You're in fight or flight mode and there are clear psychological reactions to you that make you reduce the information you take in to only the most vital ones as you perceive it. Unfortunately, your body is very bad at assessing what those vital information are. That's why we overreact to fear, for example, when someone draws a wallet and we assume it's a gun. Those are situations when civil conflicts or soldiers in civil areas and guerrilla warfare escalate wars by assuming that people are exactly violent or possessing of guns when in reality they don't because they shut down information. Thirdly, as I told you my POI, in the first world where you use cocaine, you have people under drugs. There are very strong incentive for soldiers under the current status, whether in developed or non-developed countries, to be put under circumstances where they have drugs and therefore shut out some fear. Now they rightfully say the fear will still persist, that's true. That means you have fear and are at the same moment under drugs that harm it somewhat, but also makes you more likely to go crazy, more likely to overstep those boundaries. That's why you walk into Indonesia and how most of the war crimes were committed when soldiers were heavily drunk 
drunk and no longer having all those inhibitions of stopping you. They were fearful, but also under situations where they overstepped boundaries and that was actively encouraged policies by those militias or governments. Next point, extreme nationalism. Even if we buy that point that heroism is bad, bravery is bad, if that's true, then fear is a really terrible idea. Because if you remove fear, you make a more rational calculus of being in control. You're not buying into the idea of extreme nationalism. Because what do governments do? If they want you to fight in their war, even they know you will be fearful. They need to incentivize you to still do it. One incentive you have is strong nationalism of saying, you're fighting for your country. You're so incredibly brave. You're keeping our existence up. You need you to protect you. That's when you want to become a hero. That's when you want to overstep boundaries and eradicate a large number of people. Because that's what makes you a hero. And those are things that are incentivized to a state because they want you to feel this extreme nationalist idea before that. Taking fear might cause soldiers doing something they otherwise wouldn't if they were afraid. Who's going to be responsible on trials after the war crimes have been committed? Well, hopefully the leaders, which is exactly what happens, and they're the ones causing those problems under those circumstances. So, the whole idea of the nationalism is creates the sentiment of superiority, which is exactly feeding into their idea that you feel nothing will happen. That's because you feel my nation is superior. You've been told numerous times by your leaders how superior you are, how you will win this war definitely. That's when you don't fear the rational calculus of retaliation. Extreme religious groups, if you feel you will be the martyr, if you kill many people, you will go to heaven. Again, you encourage religious leaders to feed into the narrative, overcome fear, be a religious martyr, that's so much more worthy. That shapes societal structures that A, affect soldiers, but also the society in general, that makes reconciliation harder, but that also creates conflicts in the long run. If you have several religious, more and more radicalized extreme groups, they're significantly more likely of engaging in war later on, therefore causing more war. Lastly, extreme hatred dehumanization. If you fear something, something that keeps you going is that the other side is so vicious so terrible that you need to eradicate them first. That's when politicians tell you about how they rape our women under evil monsters and the soldiers then go out to retaliate, to hate them, and then commit genocide, and then overstep the boundaries because they lose sight that those people are humans too. We want to take away that incentive and directly remove fear. That means more humane wars and a better world. Thank you very much.